Good morning, Year 6, and welcome to Monday the 8th of March's Literacy Lesson. OK, so this week we are going to be writing an explanation text about evolution. So for the first uh, two to three minutes, and I promise it'll be two to three minutes, I'm going to tell you what an explanation text is. If you already know this, fast forward about two to three minutes. Right, so the purpose of an explanation text is to explain a process. OK, it's like a set of instructions, but a lot more technical with technical vocabulary and a lot more explanation. So here are some of the features. So we have a title and technical vocabulary, an opening paragraph and quite often diagrams with illustrations. It should be written in chronological order with time conjunctions. So in the order that the process happens. Uh, it should also have cause and effect conjunctions explaining how one event leads to the next. Uh, stages should be uh, clearly broken down and put into paragraphs as well, which I think says uh, below. Uh, the final paragraph should link back to the opening paragraph. It should be in present tense with a passive voice, so something that is often done. And it shouldn't be very formal. It should be quite impersonal. OK, so uh, the example we've got here is an explanation text of how the water cycle works. So quite often uh, you find explanation texts have the beginning uh, title beginning with how and um, they have that opening paragraph there that introduces the process. So as you can see in here from the tone, it is quite informal so far. It starts off with a, a nice uh, little command and then a question. And it talks about drinking the same water that woolly mammoths did, okay, and about how the water on Earth has been recycled for four billion years. Uh, now, the reason I'm mentioning that, it will come to, uh, I'll come to that later on. So you can see from the next paragraph, it's clearly subheaded with a "How does the water cycle work?" Uh, so we will be doing an introduction as well, and then ours will be "How does evolution work?" Um, and as you can see, each process is uh, each stage of the process is broken down. I'm not going to read it out for you. Um, this is just an example. So each stage of the process is broken down. So each paragraph represents a different stage. Again, we can do that nice and easily for evolution. Uh, and there's lots of technical scientific vocabulary in each one. Um, in each paragraph as well, something that we will need to use and to understand as well, because um, there's nothing worse than uh, writing something with language we don't understand. So it's in chronological order, so it's in the order that the process happens, and there are time adverbial phrases used uh, instead of conjunction, and quite a lot of your cause and effects so conjunction, so as water vapor rises, um, and there's a few when. Yeah, when too much water. So as and when and so are going to be the conjunctions we'll use as well. Uh, and then they've got this last um, paragraph, well, second to last paragraph, it uh, just gives an example of how the water cycle can change. And you can see here they've used more cause and effects as if, and you've got wherever, the sum as well. Okay. Um, and then this final paragraph, therefore, the next time that you have a drink of water or lounge in the bath, you may be drinking or bathing in the same water as the dinosaurs were four million years ago. So it's linking it back to this water um, like it did in the introduction, four billion years and that it's been around a while. OK, so it links it back nicely in your concluding paragraph. Right then, so first things first, today then, now you need your literacy book and you need to write the date, Monday the 1st of March 2021 and the learning objective to research an animal that has adapted to a, a habitat. Okay, um, while you are doing that, the reason that we're looking at adaptation today is because it's the last part of the process for curriculum that we need to do before we write about evolution. OK, so we have learnt about um, inheritance and variation so far. Um, and today we're going to learn about adaptation and natural selection and how inheritance and variation play a big part in evolution as well as adaptation. OK, uh, so we're going to define adaptation, explain what leads to adaptations and then research an animal that is adapted to a certain environment. So just uh, to jog your memories then variation inheritance and adaptation so variation is when say you and your brothers or sisters you were all born from the same parents from your mum and dad but you are not the same you vary you are 
different. Even though you are 50% identical to your brothers and sisters um, and 50% identical to your mum or dad, um, the way that your genes have been, the way that genes are shared, and I don't mean genes that we wear, I mean genes that are in our bodies, um, the way your genes are shared makes you different from your brothers and sisters. Unless, of course, you are an identical twin or triplets. We've got identical triplets in year five. And they all come from, the, they, all have the, they all share the same DNA. So they all inherit exactly identical DNA. Um, bits of DNA okay so inheritance are inheritance is just these are things that an offspring inherits from their parents so a good example of this is eye color okay so you inherit 50% of your genes from your mum and 50% of your genes from your dad and the way that they combine makes you vary from your brothers or sisters or other siblings okay so that's what inheritance and variation are so adaptation on the other hand is something a little bit different so take uh, for example um, the triplets in year five they all have identical dna but their characteristics might be slightly different because of their environment okay and so this is what adaptation is so these are characteristics that are influenced by the living things environment now this is very very difficult to see in humans because humans have quite long lives um, in fact, the longer the life of the animal, the harder it is to see any adaptation and any variance, really. Um, but shorter lived things like bacteria and um, species of insect and birds, it's very easy to see um, lots of different changes, especially by the uh, things environment, um, because they have shorter lives and are more likely to have lots and lots of children as well. OK, or lots of offspring, rather. So environment and habitats, the first thing we need to look at. OK, now they are not the same. They are uh, quite different. So a habitat is a specific area or place where animals or plants live. OK, an environment can contain many habitats and includes areas where there are both living and non-living things. So a good example of this is a bird will live in the woods, which is its habitat. But... As you know, birds are f uh, capable of flight, so its environment could include the stream um, where it drinks, the woods where it eats and lives, the mountains, anywhere it flies. And all of these are habitats as well. So an environment, which I have a little typo for you there, environment is very much a lot of habitats coming all together. And environments can affect animals quite drastically. Okay, so... We're going to have a look at the scientific defini definition of adaptation. So adaptation means when something changes, okay? And this happens in science, scientific terms, over a long, long, long period of time, okay? And it, it's not an instant change. So when you see a fish swimming in the water in its habitat, it's very well suited to living there. So why are fish suited to living in the water? Well, the first thing is, is they have gills that allow them to breathe oxygen in the water. Uh, they have fins that allow it to move through the water easily. Um, they're very streamlined fish. They can be very thin, um, so it allows them to move quickly through the water. And they have a swim bad bladder, which is uh, it's kind of like a, it's a weird organ. So it's full of air. And it keeps the fish upright in water, so it keeps its eyes pointing upwards, more or less. Uh, if they didn't have this, um, then they'd tend to float upside down. They, you know, it's like they're in space. They can't. They, it's like they have no gravity, but obviously they're underwater. So it's very easy to think that the fish has adapted and changed to suit its hab habitat or environment, but this is again not right uh, and what we've got to remember is we see a fish now as a fish now we haven't seen what it was before okay nothing deliberately changes to adapt its environment okay so the fish developed all of these features completely accidentally and i'll explain how later on so it's not purposeful so and we know this because if we went to live in the sea as humans we wouldn't just be able to grow fins and develop gills and breathe water and go and live underwater. We wouldn't be able to just adapt that quickly. OK, like I said, it takes like millions and millions of years for it to do that. And the fish is uh, will have done that as well. OK, so the adaptations, all of those. So it's fins, it's gills, swim bladder have occurred over time. 
So these changes that occur over time are referred to as evolution and they make it easier for the fish to live in the water and survive. All right. So when something so when the fish um, hundreds of millions of years ago started to try and live in water, it would have probably looked very different. And then one day um, two fish parents will have created some offspring and one of those offspring might have had something that resembled a gill or a pair of gills like fish have now. It wouldn't be exactly the same. It would be very different. That's called a mutation. OK, so something in its DNA changed and that change made it easier to live in the water and survive. So it could live underwater for longer. It could maybe hunt more food. So because it could hunt underwater and stay underwater for longer, that particular fish then had more offspring. And some of those offspring might have had gills and would have survived to have more offspring. And then others might not have had gills and might have survived or might have died. OK, and that's what these next bits are about. So we only see the fish as it is now and not the other fish who started off similar to it, but whose adaptation made it harder rather than easier to live in the water. These fish that I was just talking about, because it was harder for them to live in the water, are now extinct. They no longer exist. Whereas the fish that had gills, one of them might have then developed another mutation which helped it flow upright in water called the swim bladder. That it gives it an advantage over its uh, brothers and sisters. So that particular fish had more babies, which then also had swim bladders. And this is how you get different species. So we've got three species of fish. The normal fish, the first fish, which you call a common ancestor. And then the second fish that had the gills. And then the third fish that had the gills and the swim bladder. OK, and that's how evolution has worked. But that would have not happened you know, sort of two, three days apart, which is how often fish breed, it would have happened over hundreds and hundreds, even maybe thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so these adaptations are successful. They allow the fish to survive in the water better. And that means this species of fish is still alive now, but the other fish will all be extinct as a result. OK, think of it like a draft. Um, so like your first piece of literacy work, we draft it, don't we? Then we look at it, we improve it, and then we publish the final version. So there's all like three versions of one piece of work. So how do living things adapt? Completely by accident. Literally, it's accidental. No, nothing has got power over what its genes or its DNA might do. So remember DNA. Here it is here. Um, there's a bit more scientific detail there if you're uh, interested. So our DNA contains our genes and that determines our characteristics, determines everything about us, what colour eyes, what colour hair, our physical appearance. It, de it determines how we think. Um, it determines everything to do with our bodies and our existence. OK, uh, now our DNA, our genes can randomly mutate. OK, so it can change just randomly. Uh, as you can see here, the way it does that. So each DNA is made up of four things called adenine, guanine, thymine and cytosine, uh, otherwise known as A, uh, G, T and C. If one of these, so let's say you've got an adenine, that happens to change to a guanine, that means that piece of DNA is mutated. OK, it's changed. And a very small change like that can affect the gene in a good way, a bad way or a neutral way, meaning that it can give it an adaptation that's good and helps it. It can give it an adaptation that's bad, that doesn't help it, or it gives it an adaptation that just changes it, that neither helps it nor um, gives it a disadvantage. Um, I hope that makes sense so far. It's very, very tricky stuff, this. So if you're confused, that's 100% fine. I'll go over it again with some examples in a minute. So eye colour is an example here. So at one point, everyone's eyes would have been blue. I'm talking million, hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, and then a random mutation occurred in the eye colour gene, making them brown instead of blue. So two parents uh, have offspring and in one of those offsprings offspring it has blue eyes but then a mutation happened in the other and causing its eyes to be brown 
that means that uh, particular offspring, when it had children, might give them blue eyes, might give them brown eyes. OK, uh, that is an example of a neutral um, change because having a different eye colour doesn't make your eyes better or worse. It is purely like a physical thing. Um, so a good thing would be like the fish, like we uh, discovered before. Um, and what when I'll go on to explain the Galapagos finches in a minute, it will be that as well. Uh, just going to ch check the time. So the a bad way, for example, is something called sickle cell anemia. So there's um, your blood uh, is a certain shape. OK, it's like a disc. And in sickle cell anemia, um, that's a mutation in the shape of your blood. It makes it a sickle. And about 25% of your blood is a sickle shape. Uh, so the say, shape of a crescent moon. Uh, and that obviously affects how much oxygen you get and um, can affect you in quite a bad way. So that's an example of a bad mutation or a negative mutation. Uh, so we're going to talk quickly about Galapagos finches because I've already spoke for 15 minutes. So the finch is here. So at one point, Galapagos finch parents reproduce and create offspring. So here are the offspring. Now you can see here, one offspring's got a tiny beak, one offspring's got a big beak. Um, they're the same. They're slightly different and unique, but their offspring, they're both from the mum and their dad. Now, on the Galapagos Islands that we learnt about last week, um, this is how Darwin came to his theory of evolution. He was looking at these birds, this exact example. So on one particular island, bad weather affected plant growth, meaning there were fewer seeds to eat that the birds usually ate. So really thin seeds that could be broken open. So the offspring had to eat bigger seeds that would not normally be part of their diet in order to survive. So as you can see here, because the seeds were bigger, they needed a stronger beak to crack. So the offspring with large beak broke open the larger seeds and they survived. The smaller offspring with uh, the offspring with smaller beaks couldn't crack open the seeds and they died. So now you're at a point where you've got only birds with big beaks surviving and no birds with little beaks surviving. So when these birds have offspring, so that's what they did there. The Galapagos features with bigger beaks reproduced and had offspring. And more of these offspring inherited large beaks. And then the Galapagos finch species started to evolve to have larger beaks. This is called natural selection. And it's called natural selection because the environment here... So the seeds, um, bad weather affected the seeds and the uh, seeds didn't grow. So there was less food. Uh, so they had to find bigger seeds to eat. The smaller beak birds couldn't open the bigger seeds. So they starved and the bigger birds had a bigger beak. So could open the seeds and they survived and they survived and had children that also had bigger beaks. So now these birds then start eating more seeds um, and they start to evolve and that mutation that affected its beak size meant that it has passed that on to its children and then more and more and more birds will have larger beaks so they are more likely to survive now they thrive in that environment these ones became extinct okay so like what i was telling you about we didn't see all the fish that came before um that's very much the case here uh, so this happened on other islands as well. So because there were about seven or eight Galapagos islands, different environments, um, the birds that all came from, you know, a finch ancestor. So they all came from the same finch, started to adapt to different environments on each island. So some birds had bigger beaks. Some birds didn't need to evolve a bigger beak um, they'd, because the seed. There, there were plenty plenty of seeds that they could crack open with a smaller beak. So some birds kept a smaller beak. On one island, there was um, no, there were very little food. And this, one of the finches, lives off the blood of other birds. So its beak became really long, sharp and needle-like. Uh, and all the, and, you know, that's just three different examples there for the finches. So that is called adaptation. It's also called evolution by natural selection. OK, right. So today's task then 
So what I'd like you to do today is choose two animals, one from an Arctic environment and one from a desert environment. And you're going to research what adaptations they have that makes living in that environment easy for them. So the Arctic environment, you're going to have the woolly bear caterpillar, the polar bear, the muskox, the Arctic fox. OK, so for each one, you'll need to write about the diets, the animals, habitat, diet, lifespan and adaptations. And then the desert ones, you've got a cactus wren, a camel a fennec fox and a thorny devil okay so you should have uh, these in your um oops, sorry yeah you should have these here so feel free to cut them out and stick them in your book about what you're writing about for each one and you should also have this here now these will have been emailed to you as well um and they will be on the website on the uh, blog for today so if you can't if, it, if you're typing it in it's not coming up uh, go on the blog and just click on the link and it'll take you straight there for each one okay so i'm going to research the cactus wren i'm just going to quickly do its habitat so hopefully this will work so got the internet very sorry for the length of this video today there's a lot to explain and really sorry for my really slow internet i can no longer work at school because i can't get into my classroom at the moment it's not going to do it is it oh yeah there we go desert museum hey so this is what comes up for a cactus rem and you can see uh here it's just a, a, a very small fact sheet so uh what was i going to write about first let's just go on here so in your book you'll need to write a little uh, heading of your animal that you're doing and then subheadings underneath so let's go back look at its habitat so they are found in deserts and arid foothills that have cactus mesquite yucca and other types of desert scrub so a desert scrub is just a fancy word for uh, like a small plant like a shrub there we go look at that nice little note taking there i'm just doing this to speed up the video um because i've already gone for 20 minutes right so that's its habitat now we want to have a look at its diet so the cactus wren eats many types of food often turning over rocks or other objects yep that's quite good beetles and other arthropods so let's put that down there so just take some very very basic notes about these but the uh, the key bit that you want guys is uh, it's adaptations so i'm just going to go to that bit there now the adaptations okay so while the female is incubating on a clutch of eggs the male wren builds another nest this this nest will be used for a second clutch of eggs as the parents may rear several broods of young in one year building the nest in a cactus provides some amount of protection for the youngs the wrens also use these nests uh, throughout the year as a place to roost now i was hoping it would give me a little bit more about yeah so that's its adaptation there so it's uh, adapted to its environment to live inside a cactus i'm sure it's had something else as well uh but never mind so obviously it lives inside a cactus let's put that oh wow look at that that went a bit wrong didn't it so it lives inside a cactus so it's uh you know highly highly useful to live inside a cactus because you're uh predators can't get you uh, and I think that's probably what it says here yeah they build nests that are the size and shape of a football with an opening at one end uh, and they do they build it inside a cactus as well there we go okay so that's my uh, first one and uh, that's what you need to do today so just to remind you of the task oh yeah that's sorry I'm losing it. Uh, write a heading, write about its habitat, its diet, a lifespan, its lifespan and its adaptations. Okay, so you can do that for one thing from the Arctic. So just pick one of these and then pick one of these from the desert as well. Please don't write about all of them. Okay, all right. Thank you, Year 6, and I will see you tomorrow.